Welcome everybody tuning in on the internet. Welcome to the vineyard. This message is called, Is Yeshua God? So here's what's going on for those of you that don't know. Some people are coming into this uh, revelation of the Sabbath and the feast and they're coming out of Christianity and then they're finding this truth which is amazing, which is awesome and, and, um, and the tendency for some that are not grounded is to begin to lean then towards Judaism. Zitzit, shofar, prayer shawls, all that stuff, which is cool. So those things are biblical, right? But the focus then gets on the stuff, and then the focus gets on um, the religion itself, which is a trap. Christianity as a religion is a trap. Judaism as a religion is a trap. I say this over and over. We are a kingdom of priests. This is, we're actually part of a kingdom, not a religious system. So once people cross over and begin to move into Judaism... Um, there di- th- then uh, what I've seen lately, especially, is a tendency to begin to doubt the New Testament as the Word of God. Paul becomes a crazy person. And then um, Yeshua is not God all of a sudden. So when you throw the New Testament out, you don't have Yeshua anymore. And people um, that I've watched actually say they would never deny Yeshua have denied Yeshua. It's heartbreaking. Many of us have wept over that. Um, so I've been addressing that, and we're going to deal with it again this week. And I probably am going to start a series just totally on Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel from Genesis to Revelation. and go about 10 years on that. We'll raise our children and grandchildren on Yeshua. <laughs> right, Tom? I like this congregation. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd come here. Because they're grounded. They are grounded in that place. They are grounded on the Holy Spirit and Yeshua. Primarily, mostly Yeshua. That's what it's all about. And so, those people at the vineyard are good people. Yahweh Echad. The Lord is one. Hero is the Lord our God. The Lord is one. The Shema. Right? We know that. So, again, there's only one God. He is a unity. The word achad can mean one, but it can also mean unity. We looked at that in last week. Uh, within the unity of God is the Father, the Word, who, who's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's not three gods. There's one God, and all of those are God. And words are important, and how you phrase things are important. Last week, we looked at how in the days of Yeshua, I'm reading two books. I got another book by the Daniel, uh, uh, what's his, yeah, Boyron. Um, and uh, it's, the, it's, it's called the, uh, the Gospel in the Targums or the Gospel of the Logos, Lagos. <clears throat> and so I'm reading two books right now that are dealing with first century um, believers in the Messiah and first century Judaism. And first century Judaism was actually looking for a father and a son. This is not Christian doctrine. They were looking at several places in the Tanakh where there's a father and a son in there. They were dealing with two Yahwehs being in the same scriptures. Um, and so um, a lot of the things that Christianity holds as core unique doctrines are not core and unique to Christianity. They're fundamentally coming from Judaism. The Bible itself, the Tanakh. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hero is the Lord our God. The Lord is one. The Targums. So this week we're going to look into the Targums. <clears throat> and and um, the Targums are Aramaic translations of the Tanakh, which is the, the Old Testament. Okay? And the Targums were available and read regularly in the synagogues in Yeshua's day. How many of you did know that? Okay. So, um, what we're going to find out is really cool that um, that the Targums are translations into um, Aramaic, and they're kind of like commentaries in some spots 
as to what was being said in the Hebrew. And then they would write some extra stuff in the Targums to help the reader understand the passage. Does it make sense? So, first of all, the Targums are um, translations. Um, and the things that we're going to look at that are in there, they're adjusted and added, are not in the original inspired Hebrew text, just so you know. But the point of me bringing the Targums to the table today is to show you that in Yeshua's day, there were a father and a son, and we're going to look at the word of the Lord personified and how that Yeshua is the word of the Lord. He's the word of God, okay? And the goal is today, when we leave, is again, I am proving with the scriptures. Today I'm using the Hebrew and the Aramaic, but I'm going to show that Yeshua is God. Okay? And you can worship him, even though he taught us to pray to the Father. Stephen prayed to him. When Stephen was getting stoned, what did he say? He said, Behold, I see Yeshua at the right hand of God. And when, Yeshua was, when, when Stephen was about to die, he did not say, Father, I commit my spirit to you. He said, Yeshua. He was talking to the Son of God when the Father was right there. So, can we pray to Yeshua? Yes. Is Yeshua God? Yes. The word in the sense of the creative or directive word or speech of God manifesting his power in the world of matter or mind is a term used especially in the Targums as a substitute for the Lord when the anthropomorphic expression is to be avoided. So what that means is, as I've been saying for years actually, in some passages in the Old Testament you see two beings both having the title Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And we're going to look at some of those today, but last week we really dealt with that. How many of you here last week? <clears throat> we're going to try to get the video out today or really quick from, from last Sabbath so that we can review this and share it. But we were showing last week how that all through the Old Testament, the many times the one called the Lord God was actually Yeshua. Okay? And so, the writers and those that translated the Targums, what they did is, when they would see Yahweh, or the Lord, capital O, capital R, capital uh, O-R-D, capital, all caps, the Lord, when they would see the Lord in another passage and see that there was two lords, or if they would see this one called the Lord, and, it was, and He was being described in human terms, they would put in there the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. So anytime the Lord was described with human terms, he was called the word of the Lord. In scripture, the word of the Lord commonly denotes the speech addressed to a patriarch or a prophet. Okay, the word of the Lord to you, the word of the Lord came to me, this is the word of the Lord. You understand? So the word of the Lord would come to a prophet, and then the prophet would say, this is, thus says the word of the Lord, or the word of the Lord. So you understand what I'm saying? So the word of the Lord would come. But the word of the Lord is also spoken of as having creative power. Okay? Why am I showing you this? Because I'm going to prove to you that the word of the Lord in the Bible is Yeshua. It's not just always the spoken words that would come from the Ruach. It's my opinion, when the word of the Lord would appear to a prophet or come to a prophet, it was Yeshua speaking to the prophet. And I've said this again, and for those that watch this and didn't see the other two parts, in the beginning in Genesis, Humans were created without sin. They had a relationship with God. They could actually communicate with the Father. This is my opinion. Once they sinned, the Bible says in the English, 
that God came and walked in the cool of the day in the garden. What it says in Hebrew is the word of the Lord echoed through the garden. So from the moment humans sinned, it has been the word of the Lord, which is pre-incarnate Yeshua. He's been the mediator from Genesis to Revelation. That's the point of the whole thing. The whole Bible is about Yeshua. He's from the beginning. And he's all the way to the end. And in, in the days to come, after he's the judge and done all everything, he's going to turn everything back over to the Father. And they will be one again, like they were before all this stuff happened. Do I understand this? No, but we're going to look at some scriptures. So by the word of the Lord were their heavens made. Now, you can just say, okay, the word that God spoke in the beginning, God said, yes, that's true. But we know from Colossians that Yeshua is the one that created everything. In Psalm 33, for he spoke and it was done. The word here and announced, the word heard and announced by the prophet often became in the conception of a seer, an anthropomorphic power apart from God. Hear that. Listen. The word was an anthropomorphic power apart from God. That meant that they were seeing two lords. One was the word of the Lord, one was the Lord, and the one called the word of the Lord was described with human terms. We see this with the angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord. The Lord sent a word against Jacob and has fallen on Israel in Isaiah 9. He sends his command to the earth and his word runs swiftly. Okay, could that just be metaphoric language? Yes, but could it mean that the word is running? He sent out his word and healed them, and he rescued them from the grave in Psalm 107. <clears throat> so the Targums are very old Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible. Now, the next few slides, I'm just going to read so you can have uh, an understanding of this. Okay, so there's a few paragraphs. They were authoritative and spoken aloud in the synagogues along with the Hebrew Torah and half Torah readings. Public reading of the scripture, scriptures in ancient synagogues were accompanied by translation into Aramaic because that was spoken language of most of the Jews in Israel and Babylon during the time of the Talmudic, Talmudic area, era. The normal practice was that after each verse was read from the Torah scroll, someone would say it in Aramaic. Targums were utilized in the synagogues before, during, and after the time of Yeshua, being necessary because many of the Jewish people that day could not understand Hebrew. Not all. Some. <clears throat> as useful and necessary as the Targums at one time were for the Jews of Yeshua's day, their teachings today often contradict the religious beliefs of many modern Jews. This is very important. And in the book, The Jewish Gospels, the foremost Talmudic scholar on the planet right now is saying this. Hear this. The foremost scholar of, of, of the Talmud in this generation says this. The teachings during the days of Yeshua, according to the rabbis and Judaism, are different than today. They're different. They've shifted. Just like Christianity, just like everything has shifted, a little leaven has got in there. And one of the main areas is um, in regard to the nature of God's word, the Mimra of the Aramaic Targums. And the word Mimra is how you say word. The most common Hebrew expression for word is Devar, uh, which can mean word, thing, matter, or affair. Devar implies content and reality in, one, in one's word. Since no one can, it's not cans, can see God, his word provides a necessary and viable link between Yahweh and his earthly creation. Listen to that. And think about pre-incarnate Yeshua and even Yeshua after he came to earth. Can you see the Father? There's a question. No man has seen him. Right? The only way humans can see the Father is through Yeshua. And before Yeshua came to earth, there was a Father and the Son. We looked at it in the Psalms, we looked at it in Isaiah, and we looked at it in Proverbs. There's a father and a son. 
So because no one can see God, and after sin came, God was hidden, and he, from, the, from that point in Genesis, God used his word to be the mediator between himself and men. And what does Yeshua say when he comes to earth? He said there's only one mediator between God and man. Right? And that's, he says, that's me. According to the Targums, which were at one time accepted as sacred Jewish beliefs, God's word is an entity, not just um, his thoughts, or not just his spoken thoughts. Isn't that interesting? To me, this is fascinating. The Mimra, which is the word, and that's how you say it in Aramaic, is to be worshipped, served, obeyed, spoken to, and prayed to as God. Isn't that something? So, we're going to look at scriptures that prove that. I believe this is a key. We will soon see the, we will soon see the Apostle John was no doubt, this is my opinion, was schooled in the Targum several years before he met Yeshua. This understanding will help us know for sure that Yeshua is indeed God. So, because these um, translations were around in Yeshua's day, what we're going to find out is when John writes, in the beginning was the Word, we're going to have new light shed on why he actually said that. Let me say that again. John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning, right? And he says the Word became flesh and dwelt among men, right? Does John write that? Now what these scholars that I'm studying are saying is that that's not just randomly thrown in there. And some even say that it's not even connected to the word of the Lord coming to the prophets as written in the Hebrew. But that he was actually referring people to the word written in the Aramaic which had anthropomorphic descriptions attached to it okay yes this is a little heavy in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God now if we could just stop right there that should settle everything but some people are throwing out the new testament so we have to learn to deal with Yeshua being God and pre-existent from the old testament all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So who is the creator? Yeshua. We will actually see that in one of the tr translations of the Targums, referring to the word of the Lord as the creator. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. No one has ever seen God. The only begotten God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. And some translations there have, for God, they have Son. Okay? Either way, Yeshua is the one that makes God known to us. Right? The word is the logos in Greek. And He says, John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word... Was God, he was with God in the beginning, right? And so, I met some people several weeks ago, and they were going to a Seventh-day Adventist church, and their pastor was teaching them that Yeshua was not in the beginning, and he did not exist until he was formed in the belly of Mary. Okay? And, um, but in Genesis it says, in the beginning, created, then it says, Elohim et Hashemayim. In the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth. And um, I believe that embedded within the Hebrew in many, many places is this word here. 
the Aleph and the Tav, and I believe that that is a symbol for Yeshua all throughout the Torah, okay? He, Yeshua, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creations, for by him all things were created. So who created all things? Yeshua, that are in heaven and are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So in the beginning here, in the beginning... Create, bara, Elohim, God, it's actually God's, et, right here. That et tells us that Yeshua is the one doing the creating, okay? Revelation 1.8 says, I am the Aleph and the Tav, in the, in the Greek it says the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Is this just a random statement? Or is it a, a, just some new revelation found only in the New Testament? If Yeshua actually, in the book of the Revelation, said, I am the Aleph and the Tav, and he's the first and the last, what does that mean? The Aleph, right here, is like saying the A. The Tav, right here, is like saying the Z. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. And he's everything in the middle. And even our Jewish brothers wrote that God created everything using the Hebrew letters of the, the alphabet. And so I believe when Yeshua was saying that in Revelation 1.8, he was actually referring us back to a passage right here. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, say, say, what's that say? And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. So what's amazing about this passage, then it goes on to say, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there's no God. You see that? This is one of the passages, just one, out of many that have two lords in it. Now I looked this up in the Hebrew to check and make sure that it did say, and his Redeemer. And so it says, Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, Yahweh Tzavaot, the Lord of hosts. How many lords are right there? Two. Now, it can be translated differently. I, I pulled out one of my Jewish translations, and they reworded it. But what I think Yeshua was referring to is this passage because he says he's the first and the last, okay? When the scripture says, I am the first, it's the Hebrew word rishon. Say rishon. And the last, and besides me, there's no other God. So it's the Hebrew word rishon. Rishon comes from the root word rosh. Say rosh. Rosh means first, it can mean head, it can mean chief, it can mean leader, it can mean a crown. It means one that wears a crown. Isn't that cool? Who's Yeshua? He's the head, he's the chief, he's the leader, and he wears a crown. He's the king, amen? That's why he's the first. Chris Egbert sent me these three scriptures all combined together. Isaiah 44. Thus says Yahweh, the king of Israel... And his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts. I'm the first and the last, and there is no God except me. And 1 Corinthians says, When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Interesting. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Yahweh, and his name one. How cool is that? All throughout the Tanakh, many places, and you can get the teaching from last week and look at it, there's two Yahwehs. The Bible is telling us, according to what Paul wrote and according to Zechariah, and I believe that he was drawing from this passage. I believe Paul was, was gleaning from Zechariah when he was saying that there's a day coming 
when God is going to completely be one again. Do I understand that? No. I don't get it. Right now, I know this, that when Yeshua ascended, when Yeshua ascended, then the disciples looked up into the sky. They said, the angel said, don't be alarmed. Quit looking up in the sky. Yeshua who went up is going to come down just like he went up. That means that Yeshua has a physical body right now, and he's coming back down. Although glorified, he has arms, he has scars, he has hair on his head. I think that's pretty cool. Whenever those who wrote the Targums came to passages where Yahweh is anthropomorphic, visible to humans, or uh, uh, um, written about in human terms... Where there are two or more Yahwehs indicated by the text, the Targums often substituted the word of the Lord for one of the Yahwehs. For example, here we go. In Genesis 19, 23 through 24, the Tanakh actually says, As the sun rose upon the earth and Lot entered the Zohar, Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfurous fire from Yahweh. Now, that's literally what it says. What does that mean? Now listen. Abraham sitting in the tent in the heat of the day just circumcised himself. Now talk about serious for the Lord and his ways. Three men come. How many? Three. He, he says, get some food. They, they eat. Two men leave that we know later are angels that go to Sodom. Right? One is left standing there. The Bible describes the one that is left standing there as Yahweh. And he talks to Yahweh, right? So, in that passage, the one called Yahweh is not the Father, it's the Son, correct? Everybody follow me. Y'all wait, what do we need to do? Some jump jacks, push-ups, we need to pass out some espresso? I know, we need some automatic, just in the back of the seats, just grab your straw. Wake up. Two leave. One person is standing there called Yahweh. And listen to what it says. Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, fire from Yahweh out of heaven. Two Yahwehs in that passage. Do you see it? Okay. So I believe the Yahweh that was on earth says, came down to see if all this stuff was really bad. Listen, he said, I need to see if it's that bad. As, uh, so he comes down, he actually goes, he's like, yeah, it's terrible. Let's go ahead. F- Father, bring it on down. Yahweh rains fire from Yahweh. Do you get that? Now, let's look at how the Targums translated that. Because what? There's two Yahwehs. They can't figure out how there's two Yahwehs. So they made one of the Yahwehs the word of the Lord. They changed the text. But they did that. Because that was the understanding in that day. You understand what I'm saying? It was like looking at my notes. If you were to pick up my Bible, let's just look real quick right here. Some of these pages that are full of notes for hopefully my son one day will grab this and look at it and say, Wow, Dad, what in the world are you talking about here? And I'm well, just, if I'm not here, you can pray and ask the Lord to help you. There's one of these pages that's all marked up. I wasn't planning on this. Okay. So I've got notes all over this page right here. All right. Just go to this passage. This means this, you know, and you write in your Bibles, right? I encourage you to do that. And that's what this was like. The Hebrew grammar here indicates that one Yahweh rained fire from another who was in heaven. The Targum stub substituted the word of Yahweh for the first of the two Yahwehs. And Genesis 19 says this, And the word of Yahweh... Calls to descend upon the peoples of Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Yahweh in heaven. Isn't that cool? Now that's in the Targum called Jonathan. So there's the Targum Jonathan, there's Jerusalem Targum, there's the Targums of Ankalos. Chris has started reading. I encourage you, you can go to the website called the Targums, and it's right there. The whole Torah is right there translated for you, and you can just read this for yourself. Exodus 20, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The Jerusalem Targum right there says, and the word of the Lord spoke all 
The excellency of these words saying, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Why does the Targums write the word of the Lord? Because in Exodus 19 and Exodus 20, right there, and then you go on through the, through the first part of the books, you see that the one called Lord has feet, eats food, and talks to Moses and the elders. That's not the Father, Yahweh. So they say, okay, it must be his word. Why? Because his word in the generation that the Targums were written, and even in Yeshua's generation, was looked at as separate from the Lord, but at the same time one with the Lord, and the one that had the human characteristics. Are you getting it? Genesis 15, And Abraham believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. According to the Targum, it was the word of Yahweh. Genesis 15, 6, from the Targum of Onkelos, And Abraham trusted in the word of Yahweh, and it counted to him for righteousness. Why? Because it was the one that they said there was two Yahwehs. They were like, well, that one that was down there was called the word of the Lord, and he made fire come from the Yahweh in heaven, so it must have been the word of the Lord who had the human features that, uh, that Abraham actually trusted in. Isn't that cool? That means that Yeshua is God. That's the whole point. Yeshua is the Lord God. There in the beginning was the Word. He existed pre-incarnation. Pre, uh, and He was called the Word of the Lord. And He was written at through the Old Testament as a son. Hallelujah. Genesis 22, so Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. In Hebrew, Yahweh Yireh. Actually, the Lord sees, and then he will provide because of what he sees. Jehovah Jireh, for those of y'all in the Baptist church. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh. All right, let's try this again. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God will provide all my needs according to his riches and glory. He will give his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Or y'all didn't come from the Sims of God or the Baptist, did you? My goodness, Wednesday night jamming on that one. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the first time the Lord started making me dance in church, I'm in the Assemblies of God. That song kicks on. Ain't nobody dancing. Ain't nobody dancing. Spirit of the Lord hits me. I start like, what is going on? I'm standing in the aisle doing this. Like, the Holy Spirit said, let it go. Just go. Next thing you know, I am out of the, I don't even know what happened. I put my hands up. I ended up in the front of the church. And they extended that song for like 10 minutes because there was a dancing maniac up there. I found out later. I just come out of the trance. I was like, how? Oh. Hey. Jessica's red face. She's like, I can't believe it. I'll tell you what, I got set free that night. Stuff fell off on me. I'm telling you the truth because I danced when the Holy Spirit said dance, and there was nobody dancing. I got freed of drugs, alcohol, and pornography. That was a breaking point in my life as I danced before the Lord, tears falling down my face, didn't even care where I didn't even know where I was. I danced like an Indian. I'm tribal, I'm Cherokee. Like a day, yes. Genesis 22 in the Jerusalem Targum. And Abraham worshiped and prayed in the name of the word of Yahweh. How cool. And said, you are Yahweh who does see but cannot be seen. So the first Yahweh, the member, serves as a mediator between Abraham and the true God. This is the understanding of the word of the Lord. A mediator. The member has significant role in Abraham's covenant. Genesis 17. And I will establish my covenant between me and you. Right? 
That's just the English from the Hebrew. Targums of Onkelos, I will establish my covenant between my word and between you. According to Jerusalem Targums, the word of Yahweh created man not only in the image of God, listen, but also in the likeness of God's word. How cool is that? Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. The Jerusalem Targum, which was read during Yeshua's day, which John would have studied and understood, had anthropomorphic um, connotation. Listen, Genesis 1.27, and the word of the Lord created man in his likeness. In the likeness... Of the presence of the Lord, he created him, male and female. His yoke fellow, he created them. Interesting. Interesting. Why? The translators of the Targums saw the word of the Lord like a human. You get it? Well, he had feet. He ate food. He talked to people. There was Ezekiel saw a man. Daniel saw a man. There was four men in the furnace. Abraham talked to a man. Moses saw a man. The elders saw a man. That's why we say amen. Goodness gracious. That was for you, Donnie. You'll get it. So the member spoke to Moses and sent him to set the children of Israel free. Listen to this. Exodus 3. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Ehia, esher ehia, in the Hebrew. And he said, say this to the children of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Right? So the bush is burning Moses approaches the bush. God speaks to him from the bush. Take your shoes off. He takes his shoes off. He's standing there. He's like freaking out. You want me to go there? Really? Uh, who, what am I supposed to tell him? So in Exodus, the Jerusalem Talmud says this. The word of Yahweh is the one speaking to Moses. I am he who said unto the world, be, and it was, and who in the future shall say to it, be, and it shall be. And he said to them, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now that's why when Yeshua said, before Abraham was, I am, you know how much sense that's going to make to people that are actually getting the Targums read to them and can read the Targums for themselves? Um, Genesis 9, and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh on the earth. In the oak on, on Kalos Targums, it says this, Yahweh said to Noah, this is the token of my covenant which I have established between my word and between all flesh that is upon the earth. Again, it's the word of the Lord right there speaking and uh, making the covenant. Now we're going to see that the memory or the word of the Lord is Israel's Savior. In Isaiah 45, 17 and 25, it says this. This is in the English from the Hebrew. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. So justification and salvation, those are synonyms. In the, on, in, in the Jonathan Targums, it says this, Isaiah 45, But Israel shall be saved by the word of Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. So they're also looking at the one that saves Israel and the one that justifies Israel is the one that has the anthropomorphic connotation, the one called the word of the Lord that eventually, John says, will become flesh or did become flesh and walked among us. So what I'm seeing as I'm studying this It is thought that John was really pointing people to the Targums as his basis of using the word. You understand? Because they knew and understand that it was the word that was like a man. Yeshua is the word of Yahweh and Yahweh, he's the great I am. Then Yeshua said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. Again, he is using the phrase that was in the bush. Do you understand that? 
Like, you know, that was, this is his way of saying when Moses was in the bush, when Moses was talking to God in the bush, that was me in there. Why? God the Father cannot come down and get in a bush. Yeshua says, then you'll know that I am. This is a reference to Yeshua being the Lord or Yahweh. This is how you write God's name in Hebrew. Now, whether you say Yehovah or Yahuwah, that's up to you. That's, there's his name again, and there's his name in the pictograph Hebrew. God's right arm becomes a man, is, is pierced. That's what the nail is, and then is a man. Or behold the man, behold the nail is how you can say that. When you make God's name, the point of me showing you these slides, when you turn God's name Yahweh and write it vertically, watch what happens. It turns into a man. You see that? yod heh vav hey. So, there it is. There's his head. This is his torso. I mean, there's his arms, torso, and legs. That's how cool that script is. Even though that wasn't the original script of the Hebrew, it's pretty cool that when you turn it vertically, it becomes a man. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and it said this, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And what you can do is take the Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, and it spells Yahweh's name. Yeshua of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And written in Hebrew, each word if you take the first letter of each word and drop it down, it spells out Yahweh's name. Okay? So it is believed that the reason that Yeshua said, when you lift up the Son of Man, you'll see that I am. You can turn that back. He was actually pointing to a fact that written and embedded in the sign would be Yahweh's name. Then said the chief priests... To, of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. Why did he want to change the sign? Well, because they were seeing that Yahweh's name was spelled in the sign. And the prophecy was actually coming to pass that Yeshua said, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will see that I am. Isn't that cool? Then Yeshua had said to him, when you lift up the Son of Man, you'll know that I am. And this I am was referencing the name, which was embedded in the sign above his head. And there it is again. yod heh vav heh Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Akkad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And we know that that is unity. God is one. But there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit. Okay? So even though there are people out there challenging the fact and the truth that Yeshua is God and they're throwing away the New Testament and they're renouncing Him as their Savior, I want us to be settled. The reality is, I don't know how that's possible because I know the man. I know him. I know him. He talks to me. Hopefully you know him. If you don't know him, please come see me or Tom. If you don't really, really know him, he says, my sheep will hear my voice. Do you have a relationship with God that you can talk to him and he talks back? Are your sins forgiven? Are they white as snow? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Just like Brother Kevin said, we have no hope. We're out of covenant without the blood of the Messiah. We are lost in this world, mixed up Gentiles in the nations forever. And it was only through Yeshua that we can be brought back into covenant because he died to release Israel from that curse. So praise the Lord. Thank you, Yeshua. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those men that translated the Targums 
and for the insights that they bring to the table. And again, we declare Yeshua who Adon. Yeshua who Adon. Yeshua is Lord. Yeshua who Adon. Yeshua who Yahweh Tsevaot. Yeshua is the Lord of hosts. Yeshua, Eloheinu, Yeshua is our God. Father, bless your people today as we enjoy your Sabbath. Teach us your ways. Draw us close to your Son. Help us to walk in repentance. Amen, hallelujah, Shabbat shalom, everybody. Amen.